So thank you very much, Kilian, for your very extensive uh, introduction. And in particular, of course, I, I thank you and your colleagues and the people responsible for this uh, invitation to hold the inaugural Jose uh, Baluenga lecture. It's a great honor, and I'm extremely happy to be here back in this beautiful city. Now, ladies and gentlemen, science is always competitive. And but today, I have a very strong competitor. Namely, I'm going to try to compete here with all of these beautiful decorations in the wall. And I'm very happy that uh, it's raining. Otherwise, most of you would probably be walking around in the beautiful city. Well, I think chemists are quite familiar with uh, all of these terms. Uh, <clears throat> Well, you know what enzymes are, you know what stereoselectivity is, it's asymmetric reactions, <clears throat> but you may not be all that familiar uh, with uh, directed evolution, but you know what evolution in nature is. It's a powerful driving force comprising never-ending cycles of mutagenesis selection, mutagenesis selection. Uh, and that's the reason why nature has come up with such complicated biological systems that we're all familiar with. So in the 1990s, uh, I developed the idea of trying to mimic natural Darwinian evolution <clears throat> and put it in the test tube, but not wait for millions of years, but to put evolutionary pressure on cycles of mutagenesis and selection or screening in order to develop enzymes that do what the operator, what the chemist wants them to do, namely have high levels of uh, stereoselectivity, activity, and so on. Now, my, the outline of my lecture is uh, shown here. This work has become very, very extensive, and it breaks my own rule of changing a uh, topic every eight, nine years. I've been in this twice the number of those years. Uh, so I need to give you uh, an introduction um, featuring some of our early work. The heart of our work the last seven years or so is actually methodology development in directed evolution. So it's very analogous to methodology development in synthetic organic chemistry. So this involves a lot of uh, molecular biology, but that's something that most of you are not interested in, but it is the heart of our research, so I'll give you a, a, at least a glimpse of, of the challenges involved. And uh, then the main part will uh, focus on uh, stereoselectivity, regioselectivity in our more recent uh, work. Now you all are aware of the fact that enzymes have been used in organic chemistry for more than 100 years. Um, however, traditional limitations remained. Very often, you have a narrow substrate scope. So if you have a certain compound, you want to, trans you want to transform it, it doesn't work. And that's not surprising because nature did not do us the favor of uh, developing and evolving enzymes that do anything we want. But there are, of course, a number of uh, a case is known where uh, the naturally occurring enzymes are used in industry, but you have the narrow uh, substrate scope. Often poor uh, stereoselectivity, sometimes insufficient stability, sometimes product inhibition. Now during the last 10 or 15 years, the picture has changed completely thanks to directed evolution, where we can at least address these uh, problems. I'm not going to claim today that anything can be solved. That would be uh, not honest. So we have to be modest, but I will try to show you that we now have developed the tools with which you can address these uh, fundamental uh, problems. The common gene mutagenesis method, some of the older ones and the newer ones, the modern ones that rely on molecular biology, gene technology, error-prone polymerase chain reaction is a shotgun method where you address the whole gene and therefore the whole enzyme that is encoded by this uh, gene, the DNA. Saturation mutagenesis developed by uh, Jim Wells means that you 
uh, focus your randomization using the 20 naturally occurring canonical amino acids as building blocks, but you restrict it to a certain site. And then you have DNA shuffling developed by the late, uh, uh, and a good, was a good friend of mine, uh, Pim Stemmer. Now, most of this work here was uh, performed by molecular biologists uh, who were interested in, in their establishing certain methods. And they did not really apply them, uh, at least up here, uh, but others did. And uh, here you see a few names. The list is not uh, complete. People who made initial libraries and then screened for enzyme stability robustness, which is an important subject. Now, these initial libraries uh, really do not mean directed evolution, because they did not go into a second round, taking the best one and then putting evolutionary pressure on it, go through another round. But Hageman did. So in my opinion, Hageman is, is a, a real pioneer. It was a simple case, but the principle was uh, established. Strangely enough, he's never cited, but I always have him in my review articles, etc. Then we have this seminal paper by Frances Arnold, 1993. She went through six rounds of error-prone PCR in order to increase the robustness of a certain enzyme. It was a protein uh, proteinase. But we were, as organic chemists, interested more in the heart of uh, uh, synthetic problems, namely asymmetric catalysis. So here you see the general scheme. It gives you a little, it's a little glimpse into how things are actually done in the laboratory. So let me take you through this very briefly. We start with a gene, in other words, the DNA of an enzyme that does not what we do what we want it to, uh, to do. And it is subjected to one of those methods of uh, gene mutagenesis, and we get a library of mutant genes in the test tube. The, these are then inserted into a bacterial host, such as E. coli, and then you play it out on agar plates, technique that's 100 years old, and you uh, get not one, but many, many agar plates, depending how much work you want to invest. And after a while, you see little bacterial colonies growing, each coming from a single cell. So in each one, you do not have a mixture of mutants. That would be a catastrophe. You harvest these, and we started with toothpicks. We bought the most number of toothpicks in the state that we were working at, not in this farm, than all of the restaurants in, in Germany. But after a while, we uh, bought a uh, colony picker, so this is scratched off, this one, this one, this one, put into the wells of microtiter places, about two milliliter uh, little wells. They're given food, bacteria feel good. We have hundreds of these uh, plates and hundreds of little factories generating potentially uh, stereoselective enzymes. So then we take a little bit of this and put it on a different uh, microtiter plate. They're numbered and so on. And then we screen for stereoselectivity. For example, either R in antioselectivity or the mirror image S. And here you see symbolically some hits. Uh, here the green one if it's R, the red one if it's S, going in that direction. Now, in most cases, this will not be 99% EE yet. Uh, so you may go up from 20% EE to maybe 35 or whatever, and then you extract the uh, DNA, the uh, mutated gene, subject it to another round and another one until stepwise you increase stereoselectivity to the point where you're happy with. So obviously this concept is quite different from uh, developing uh, in antiselective synthetic catalysts with uh, different ligands and so on. To me, this is the most rational way to develop um, uh, yeah, asymmetric uh, catalysts because we rely on this evolutionary uh, pressure. Now, where are the challenges? One is high throughput screening. There were none here. I don't have time to talk about that. And the other one is here. Which of those mutagenesis methods, and there are a few other ones as well, 
are the best ones to apply. So this is methodology development. Notice that these two uh, factors are really related. If we can make smart libraries, then they're smaller, less screening. Screening is the bottleneck of directed evolution. Let's remember that. So proof of principle, way back in 97, we took this uh, racemic uh, ester, and um, it's, the, the hydrolysis is catalyzed by a lipase, so that's uh, well known. But the selectivity factor in this kinetic resolution is poor. E equals 1.1. It's a relative rate of one enantiomer with respect to the other. Organic chemists use small s sometimes, but it's the same thing. So the goal was to evolve for the first time using this principle that I just illustrated in order to get a better one. And here you see uh, the result, four cycles of error-prone PCR. It was a stepwise staircase picture that we mapped, and it went up to a factor of 11. And that was proof of principle, the first case. However, when we went into the fifth round, it, was, it only went to 13. So that was a clear signal that error-prone PCR, repeating uses of it, is not the way to go. So this is about three years, four years of work. Let's skip this and go to the Angewandte 2001 paper where we describe two different uh, approaches. One was saturation mutagenesis at this site around the binding pocket. And here you see the result, it went up to 30. Uh, that was really fantastic, but we missed the boat because we interpreted this result in not the proper manner. Why? Because the combination of error-prone PCR saturation and DNA shuffling gave us a better result. And we developed, we evolved this one with a factor of 51. At the, we looked at 50,000 reactions. That's quite a bit of uh, work, but in those days that, that was really a, a nice breakthrough. But we missed the boat here. Now, we did the uh, characterization, kinetics, et cetera, and then teamed up with Walter Thiel, the theoretician in Mülheim at the time, and it turned out that uh, we predicted that we only need two of the six mutations. So we made the double mutant, and it was even better, E equals 63. Now that was a triumph of theory, obviously, but it also was a clear signal almost 10 years ago that this is all successful, but it's not efficient. We were collecting four mutations that were superfluous. So now it was clear we need to do methodology development more systematically rather than trying various uh, things. So luckily we remembered this little experiment in the 2001 paper and we return to this. And today we call this the power of saturation mutagenesis. Away from blind directed evolution. If you see, if I go through this now, you obviously will say, it's so logical. Why didn't we do this in the first place? Well, that's how science is. You're not always as smart as you could be. At least we're not. Uh, but we generalized on this uh, idea that we had already published as years before. And now you see we, this uh, process of the binding pocket, and it's of course reminiscent of Emil Fischer's lock and key principle, so we have different sites, A, B, C, D, and so on. And this is where we now have the criterion for deciding where we should randomize and focus our mutagenesis. Now, if you, you need the X-ray structure or a homology model, and if you look at that data then on your screen, you see a lot of side chains of amino acids around here pointing at the binding pocket, but you don't know which one to choose in their single sites. Well, we can group them into uh, sites composed of more than just one amino acid, two or three. How should we do this? And why should we do it? And if these initial libraries that we're going to create do not give up, uh, come up with 99EE, what happens then? There the idea was we can make 
uh, internets here. We can take the mutations here and then visit this site. In other words, do iterative saturation mutagenesis. But you can go from here to here or from here to here, here. There's a huge uh, combinatorial network possible. And uh, how to approach this, how to get a general scheme of this, I will show you in a minute. Now, of course, Linus Pauling's extension of Emil Fischer means that not just the shape selectivity is important, but also the uh, stabilization of the transition states. So we need to have mutations here and here that not only make the shape correctly, reshaping the binding pocket, but also ensure perhaps new uh, activating uh, hydrogen bonds or whatever to stabilize the transition state. Thermal stabilization has a different criterion. I don't want to go uh, into that, but except just to mention the name, Daniel Caballero, one of the uh, really talented uh, Spanish postdocs uh, that I had. So what about this networking? Here's the concept, iterative saturation mutagenesis, ISM. Not to be confused with ESM in the financial crisis, ISM really works. So you can have different uh, number of randomization sites, two or three, four or five or whatever. This is just an illustration for a four randomization sites, A, B, C, D. We make those libraries, screen, and put the winners here, 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 and here. This upward coordinate means stereoselectivity. And if this is not 99%, we need to put evolutionary pressure on this system. So we take the gene of this mutated uh, enzyme and use it as a template to visit B, C, or D. B, C, or D. And the same thing here. And then we continue to, we have visited all of them. So this is 24 uh, pathways in a four site uh, uh, system in a, a three-site system that's much smaller, and so on. This is just one uh, possibility. When I first drew this, I was a little scared, and uh, I did not like it, because I thought, who wants to go through 24 pathways? That's too much work. And what happens if you encounter, let's say, if you choose this pathway, and there's a local minimum, there's nothing in that library here. Uh, it's a dead end. What do you do? And dead ends are always uh, uh, a nuisance and a fundamental problem in all of directed evolution. Doesn't matter which uh, mutagenesis method uh, uh, you use, it's a much feared phenomenon. Well, we've resolved all of those questions and we've developed methods of how to escape in an easy manner out of uh, local uh, minima. Now, I need to confront you with some statistical aspects, otherwise you will not understand the challenges involved. Let's focus on so-called NNK codon degeneracy. This means simply we're using 20, the 20 naturally occurring amino acids as building blocks at a certain site where we introduce them randomly. Now let's look at this second one. Uh, a site composed of two amino acid positions. Our calculations show that we should, for 95% library coverage, we should screen 3,000. Well, what about using, uh, and if we go to a four, it's uh, 100,000, and a five, I don't even want to go through here all of this data, uh, a site composed of five amino acids, uh, you can see it's three million. So this is a statistical problem connected with the screening uh, question. But now let's imagine, as organic chemists, I don't need these 20 building blocks. I only need 12, let's say. A nice cocktail of uh, polar, non-polar, aromatic, non-polar, charged, non-charged. Let's use those as building blocks, so-called NDT codon degeneracy. And then our calculation shows in the two amino acid site we only need 400 instead of 3,000. And in the uh, three uh, residue site, instead of 100, 5,000. And this goes on, of course, here. So 
this is not the only possibility. You can use even smaller amino acid alive areas, and then you can go into some of these larger sites. So this is a fascinating uh, uh, analysis, I think, and we've done a lot of, lot of work here. Just one final uh, uh, comment. If we go through these steps, we accumulate mutations and sets of mutations. But in the second, third, and so on, and we don't know how those contributions contribute separately, alone, because we measure the accumulation. So if we deconvolute, we find really mind-boggling effects. I think those are the, the most important spin-off of all of our research is that mutations here and mutations here are not simply additive. If this is this much, that's that much. Traditionally, people would expect if you combine, it's this much. Well, it can be that much all the way up there. We have cases where just now a new paper will be accepted in JAX. A mutation that has, a mutant that has four single uh, point mutations. Together, they're 99% are selective. Each individual one alone is S selective. So completely new way of thinking in uh, protein engineering. I don't have time to really go into that. Further developments, I'm not gonna uh, go here into any detail, but just look at the journals that, of course, our organic chemists do not read. We can eliminate amino acid bias because the genetic code is degenerate. We can take care of that. And this paper is maybe 10 years ahead of its time. Instead of PCR-based molecular biology, we use solid, combinatorial solid phase gene synthesis. And what does that mean? Now, gene synthesis at the moment is getting cheaper and cheaper, but it's still so expensive. But we use, uh, we don't make 100 or 1,000 uh, gene uh, syntheses, but we have um, yeah, um, uh, cassettes of syntheses that we combine. And maybe in 10 years when gene synthesis costs go down, that will be the way to proceed. So if I say ISM is so great, I better prove it. Um, and this boring reaction with this boring lipase is the most intensively studied enzyme in all of directed evolution. So it's a wonderful playground to, pre, uh, to compare different strategies and different mutagenesis methods. And that, you remember, was our last best hit. And we went back, instead of 50,000, we looked at only 9,000. Instead of six mutations, four of which are superfluous, we have only three mutations, and we know we need all three of them. And they are, uh, they are very cooperative within one another, much more than uh, simple additivity. Now, ISM has been used by last three years, four years, by a number of other groups, and I don't have time to really uh, appreciate their contributions, but I want to focus the rest of the talk on our own examples, examples where reactions are involved that are not easily or are not really possible using modern synthetic catalysts. So this will be restricted to reduction and uh, oxidation. So here's one. If you look at ketones of this kind and you reduce them, you get chiral products. Now this is axial chirality. And if you use the best Noyori type catalysts, and we've done that, you essentially get racemates. Why? Because the alpha alpha prime positions are almost are essentially identical. In Noyori chemistry, you need different uh, steric or electronic effects uh, at these positions. And here you see the result. There's an alcohol dehydrogenase. The wild type, the original, as it occurs in nature, is poorly in anti-selective. And here we were able to evolve R selectivity and S selectivity. We looked at other substituents here as well without doing additional mutagenesis. The, the actual evolution was done on this substrate. And in a few cases, uh, that was uh, 
okay, it was successful, but as organic chemists, you will see, okay, why we chose this one as the model reaction, because we uh, performed palladium catalyzed carbonylation and Suzuki and so on, so we can get a whole range of these uh, uh, products. Now, what about the, uh, the question of evolving something for one substrate? Is that mutant useful for other substrates? This is a fundamental question because you don't want to have all of this work uh, for each new substrate. And just uh, as an example, an older one, uh, biovilica monooxygenase, cyclohexanine monooxygenase, I'll show you quickly one example. Some of these R group, if this is methyl or ethyl or chloro, it's 95% EE in favor of this one. But if you vary, it immediately is no longer an antiselective. So some years ago, we took R equals hydroxy, the alcohol, and evolved one that was uh, fairly selective. It was actually for, for this one. And uh, here, there's some, uh, I don't want to go into the mechanism. Here are the names of the pioneers. Let me show you now the result of that one mutant that gives us this one with hydroxy. And we sent this mutant to Marco Vilovich in Vienna. He had all of these nice uh, uh, prochiral uh, substrates, and you see the desymmetrization and the EE values with this exception are really fantastic. And I challenge you to think of a synthetic catalyst that will allow you chemoselectively and and then to selectively to go into uh, this one. But let me now turn to another type of oxidation, partial and selective oxidation. This is catalytic CH activating P450 enzymes. This is the basic reaction that's known, been known for a long, long time. Uh, this is a uh, iron heme dependent uh, enzyme system. It's a radical process. This hydrogen is extracted in a radical manner. You get the R radical and then fast rebound uh, to the alcohol. By rational design and directed evolution, a number of groups have been working in this the last 15 years or so. But the challenges remained up to 2010, namely the control of regio and stereoselectivity. I'm an organic chemist, as you know, and if you have only regio and not stereo, that's not acceptable. Or if you have 5% uh, for one product and 99 EE, that's also nothing. It's not worth it, so you need both. And that was the challenge. Controlling regio and stereoselectivity. We started with this enzyme and we used testosterone, the steroid, as the model uh, reaction. Uh, with a starting enzyme, it's a 50-50 mixture of these two regioisomers plus about 4 or 5% of other alcohols. So the goal was uh, we want a catalyst that delivers only this one, the 2-beta-hydroxy, and a different one that gives us only this one. And a very difficult um, challenge at the time. Today, it's uh, just two or three years later. Okay, it works. So here are our cast libraries uh, around the bind. Here's the heme iron. Here's our substrate that we docked in to get some idea where the cast libraries around the binding pocket, lock and key, uh, principle of Emil Fischer. So these are now double uh, uh, two and three amino acid positions. We used reduced amino acid alphabets and so on. There are more around here, but we started with these uh, three. So here are the results. Let's just go through at the final result. Uh, one round, round of iterative saturation mutagenesis. We have a two beta selective variant. 97% uh, regio selectivity and 100% uh, beta uh, stereoselectivity, no erosion. And then we have the other one, 15 beta, 96% to here. Now, in the meantime, we also were able to invert and uh, get the alpha attack. But at this point, I want to emphasize the fact I don't want to give the impression that we can 
do anything that would be dishonest. So we have to be modest. Again, we're providing tools with which you can do that. Now, suppose you want to go to this position. We've developed some uh, ideas on how to do that. Uh, but we have to test this in the next three or four years. So that's the state. But we also looked at other um, uh, steroids uh, in this paper. Now, how can we explain this high selectivity? This is a radical process, high energy process. So line, this is not a case for Linus Pauling. I don't think the uh, environment around this uh, substrate will stabilize the transition state of a radical process, maybe to a small extent, but not really to a significant degree. The answer is it must be shape selectivity. Apparently, we have reshaped the binding pocket, in this case, for example, so that this compound here is held exactly in the right pose. And that is indeed shown here. These are not simply quickly performed docking experiments where we just put this in. This took uh, about four months of calculations. And indeed, in the two beta selectivity, you see this, uh, the testosterone and the two beta hydrogen here is really pointing at this uh, active uh, high spin iron double bonded oxygen uh, species for radical ex uh, abstraction. And even the angle is, is almost correct, 130 degrees. Uh, Mulholland, uh, Adrian Mulholland in, in, the, in England has done calculations and suggests it should be about 130. We didn't know it at that time. And here you see the 15 beta. It has a completely different pose. Now what about the starting enzyme? That has also these poses, but they're of similar energy. Now here, there are also other poses up here, but that's so far away that nothing happens. This is the only pose in the vicinity of this high spin catalytically active iron compound, intermediate, so-called compound, Roman numeral one compound. So now what about smaller molecules? People at that time were saying, okay, steroids are very rigid, they're large, and they fit into this large binding pocket of our, uh, of our P450. The smaller ones will spin around and you'll have problems. Well, we, that's why we chose this one. And very briefly, you can see the result. ISM gives you this. The wild type has about 75% uh, regional selectivity, which is not good enough, and only 34% EE in favor of the R. This is 95% uh, regio and better than 95% EE. And here is the reverse 95. And you can do this. We've done this on a uh, uh, three, four, five millimole scale. If you want to go up to a, let's say, 100 grams, let's pose that critical question. Then in our lab, we cannot do that because you need bioprocess engineering. And people like Woodley and so on, uh, they know how to do uh, that. But we very often uh, go further and do some palladium catalyzed uh, reactions. And here you see acylation and then uh, Suji Trost kind of allylic substitution with retention of configuration. These are alpha, beta, gamma amino acids, so they're GABA analogs. These are new compounds. Maybe they're of interest to neurochemists uh, and neuroscientists. Uh, now, what about the question, again, of using evolved enzymes for similar or other substrates? Here we took this literature uh, compound. It has an additional double bond here. This is a known Zolder reaction. And we took the best previous R-selective one and tested it here. You see it's not perfect, but it's okay, 84. And this one is a little better, 93% uh, S selectivity. If you desperately need this compound, one would start with that gene and then do some more uh, mutagenesis. That's the uh, general uh, recommendation. Now, the reason why this may be of interest is that the synthesis of the racemate was performed by Danny Shevsky a long time ago. 
and Birch Toad in the also US made this compound in the siloil, O siloil protected form in 11 steps. So here you see once again the complementarity of, of modern uh, methods in organic chemistry and the biocatalysis. I think we need both as toolbox. It's not a matter of saying, okay, everything can be done with bio or everything can be done with uh, modern uh, transition metal or organocatalysts. I think people are realizing that. But I want to emphasize the complementarity because none of those last reactions can be performed presently with any modern synthetic uh, catalyst. At the very end, let me introduce you to something uh, that's quite uh, reasonable for organic chemists. But no one in this huge field of P450, and there are about 2,000 papers every year, most of them mechanistic, but a lot of them in this kind of uh, protein engineering. When you do this, let's go, just go quickly back. Each single hydroxylation event introduces a single new center of chirality, right? It can be an enantiomer or it can be a diastereomer, as in the case of uh, steroids. But can you think of something where one single event creates two or maybe even three new centers of chirality? Well, organic chemists can come up with the right answer, uh, at least formally within uh, a few minutes. Imagine you have a, uh, an achiral compound of this kind. It can be cyclic. And on the left side, you have, and on the right side, you have identical uh, things. You have, if you can get uh, oxidation to be uh, focused on the ortho, on the alpha, alpha prime positions, you have four different possibilities. So if you let HB, you get this one. If you let HC across the street, sort of speak, yeah, then you get this one. These are enantiomers. And you see two new stereocenters, not just one where the hydroxy is. And if you now look at the others, HA in the back, you get this one. And HD across the street, also in the back, you get that one. These are also enantiomers, but these are, of course, diastereomers. So can you control this? And here you see the challenging examples. This simple ketone, this is the cyclic case. So here you have four, two, four uh, hydrogens. And these are the four products. And here you see the best mutant. It's not perfect. It's 78% goes into these uh, uh, alpha positions yeah, or alpha prime. But diastereoselectivity is perfect almost. In antioselectivity, conversion is excellent, and so on. And even this one that has no functional group where docking by hydrogen bonds can occur, it's also here and at the expense of regioselectivity a little bit. So this is far from uh, uh, perfect. Again, I don't want to claim that anything can be done, but this is a start into this new area because these are added value uh, compounds and one can think of lots of other uh, substrates. So let me uh, show you one last chemical slide, not just uh, reductions and oxidations, but there are about three dozen uh, papers out there using ISM, uh, prot in antiselective protonation, in antiselective aldol type reactions. And let me just focus this one. This is a collaboration between Merck in the USA and uh, Codexis, a biochemical company. And they used uh, ISM here in order to go from a ketone reductive aminatively to the uh, amine. And they have upscaled this to, uh, I think, 50 kilograms or more uh, at the moment. So they uh, used our method whether they cite us is a, is a different problem. Okay, let me come to a close. Uh, important uh, conclusions. Elimination of traditional limitations of enzymes as catalysts in organic chemistry and uh, biotechnology. Uh, I think uh, iterative saturation mutagenesis is most efficient of all the methods. And I hope to have shown you that this is structure-driven. Uh, it's uh, knowledge-based. 
So it's, it's fairly rational. It's a combination, really, of rational design and, uh, let's say, more classical directed evolution. So I believe that uh, directed evolution has now a, a rational uh, character away from blind uh, processes that were uh, used uh, uh, earlier. And we can use this uh, casting and this uh, cast is simply an acronym for something that we did, as I said, a long time ago when we, in stereo selectivity, when, when I said we missed the boat. Um, now, uh, a lot of people use the term cast, but others don't, that's not so important. The important point is that we can control substrate scope, stereo selectivity, regio selectivity, uh, the B-fit thermostability, uh, developed by uh, Daniel Caballero, the Spanish uh, postdoc, has a different criterion, but it works uh, also iteratively. We look at high B factors in X-ray structures where you have a lot of wiggling going on and you want to rigidify. That tells you where you should focus for a parameter that's very, very different. And of course, you can combine these uh, two uh, approaches. Multi-residue sites, uh, this is a very general uh, conclusion. Multi-residue sites are preferred over one residue sites using reduced amino acid alphabets for minimizing uh, screening. And we've shown this statistically with a number of studies that I did not uh, feature today. And again, large cooperative mutational effects within the multi-sites uh, residue site and between sets of mutations in this pathway uh, shows that we have, um, are existing much more than additivity uh, predicts. So the question of um, additivity versus non-additivity in the sense of cooperativity is I think a, a fundamental one and it's more common than people have believed. And it's telling me that enzymes are more complicated than anyone ever thought, at least that's how I view it. Um, I call them nonlinear systems, nonlinear systems in the sense of, of, of mathematics. And that's why I think it will be very difficult to develop a general theory, let's say in the next 100 years, that will always predict exactly what uh, to do because of these crazy effects. And again, combining two SS selective mutants and you get R selectivity, who would, who would do this, right? But to understand them on the molecular level with X-ray and so on, what we have done is in fact rewarding. So here you see our review on ISM and the perspective on uh, biocatalysis. And one last word about the future. I think we will have uh, more practical applications of uh, iterative saturation mutagenesis. Uh, enzyme promiscuity is a huge uh, uh, challenge. Uh, we do not have a breakthrough in this, let me put it that way. Uh, but it means getting enzymes to act as catalysts for reactions that are not known in nature, and then to use ISM, for example. We have some examples, but they're not really that impressive. So they're not science or nature papers. Uh, genetic tuning of hybrid catalysts, where you put, let's say, a transition metal ligand uh, into uh, a host protein, or an organocatalyst into a host protein, you get a single catalyst, but then you can do the kind of evolution that I told you about, and the number of groups are in this. Uh, we have uh, also some contributions, actually a patent from the year 2001. Microbial pollution cleanup, this refers not to stereoselectivity, but to um, uh, robustness, you need robust uh, catalysts. And very important, metabolic engineering as a complementary alternative to natural products synthesis. I need to mention Jay Kiesling um, and, uh, and other people here. So 
Let me now acknowledge all the people in the last years here, going back to 1996 about when we started this adventure. Remember, uh, we had to uh, establish gene labs. We had to learn all about uh, molecular biologists. So very soon after those initial experiments, I hired molecular biologists who worked together with organic chemists and uh, so it's really an interdisciplinary uh, uh, process and analytical chemists. Of course, there are a lot of technicians' names here from our institute. These are my present uh, people in my group. I, I have six uh, postdocs financed by the Max Planck Society in a very generous manner as an emeritus. Here you see another uh, Spanish uh, person here. The people that we collaborate with, we get the enzymes, the genes, um, protein NMR, uh, protein X-ray, uh, in silico, and so on. And we we find the people that are really uh, useful in a in a nice collaboration. Here are the funding people. So I thank all of them here, and I thank you for your attention, but I do want to show you the most important slide of my whole talk, and that is this one. Now, uh, I was going to learn how to pronounce this, but <laughs> I simply did not have the time. I was so busy. Uh, but those of you who do not understand Spanish, I don't know if there's anyone in there, let me translate. I wish you all the best for the future including, of course, good health and continued fascination for chemistry. Thank you very much.